Then we're going to have the judges introduce themselves, and then you will introduce yourselves, and we'll get started. So take it away, judges. How are you this afternoon? Good. How are you? I don't dare say you're not tired, are you? Because we are. No, never. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> well, maybe I shouldn't have even brought it up. <laughs> I'm Rita McCannon. I'm an attorney from Huntsville, Alabama. Um, I just love y'all school and I love your state competition and I'm really glad we're here with y'all this afternoon. My colleagues are. I'm Jack Barlow. I teach politics at Juniata College in Pennsylvania and I missed my nap this afternoon. <laughs> I'm Tim Moore from the University of Wisconsin at Madison uh, from the Center of the Study of the American Constitution. It's great to be here. Well, thank you guys again for taking the time out of your guys' busy schedules to um, facilitate this competition for us. We are the Virginia Wildcard team from uh, Douglas Freeman High School just outside of Richmond, Virginia. Our instructor is Mr. Rob Peck. My name is Kieran Wall. My name is Britt Pardon. My name is Jack Keller, and we're looking forward to our conversation today with y'all. Great, great. We're glad to be with you. We're going to talk about question two with you, two. So while you're getting yourselves ready, I will read the question. When explaining why the proposed constitution lacked a bill of rights, one federalist claimed that in a government possessed of enumerated powers, such a measure would be not only unnecessary, but preposterous and dangerous. Do you agree or disagree with this statement? Why or why not? In your opinion, did the first 10 amendments to the Constitution sufficiently address the concerns of the Anti-Federalists? To what extent, if any, should we consider adding additional amendments to our Constitution? We look forward to hearing from you and you may begin. Although we often associate bills of rights with Enlightenment era republics, the first known charter of human rights originated in ancient Persia. The Cyrus Cylinder, issued by Cyrus the Great, outlines the rights of Babylonian citizens including religious freedom and equality under the law. The more than 2,500 year old clay cylinder stands as a symbol of the enduring human tradition of enumerating rights. Despite this historical precedent, some founders were vehemently opposed to including a bill of rights in the American constitution. Hamilton for one contended that since the constitution created a system of enumerated powers, there was no need to fear overreach or infringement. In his words, the people surrender nothing and as they retain everything, they have no need of particular reservations. Other federalists, like James Wilson, said that the consequences of an imperfect enumeration is that the rights of the people would be rendered incomplete. However, we generally disagree with the federalist assertion that a bill of rights would be dangerous. Consider British history. Despite repeated assertions of rights, Englishmen still found that their rights were rich. For instance, despite Magna Carta's contention that to no one deny or delay right or justice, in the English Petition of Right request for due process of law, Due process was repeatedly denied by the Crown in the form of closed privy councils and star chamber trials. It was not until the introduction of the English Bill of Rights, in which the King was expressly bound to a detailed enumeration of rights, that the rights of Englishmen were firmly secured. Also, if the Ninth Amendment's addition to the Bill of Rights would help to calm some of those concerns, it would be dangerous to and limit the rights of the people. Additionally, despite Hamilton's assertions, the Constitution was not solely a document of specifically enumerated powers. Although Bill of Rights was added to the Constitution, history has shown that perhaps the Bill of Rights was not the cure-all to government overreach that was anticipated by many. Anti-Federalist grievances against the Constitution can be broken into three categories, a lack of a Bill of Rights, a dominant federal government, and a vaguely structured Supreme Court. The only concern that the Bill of Rights solved completely was the Anti-Federalist demand that there be a Bill of Rights. Despite the 10th Amendment's assurance that powers not delegated to the United States are reserved to the states, it has been largely undermined, and the fear of the anti-federalists of an overly powerful federal government has persisted. Using the necessary and proper and supremacy clauses, the federal government has adopted policies like preemption that assume the, the very dominance over the states the anti-federalists feared. As seen in Garcia v. San Antonio Transit Authority, the Tenth Amendment does little to stop federal interference with intrastate regulations. While the Bill of Rights took no steps to limit the Supreme Court, the Court's relationship with the Bill of Rights has been mostly expansionary. Using the power of judicial review, the Court, especially in the Warren era, secured many more rights for Americans, chief among them the right to privacy. Although the Court made strides to codify rights, it would be in the spirit of Wilson to create a more complete enumeration by passing certain constitutional amendments. 
One example of an additional amendment that could be added is the Equal Rights Amendment, ensuring equal legal rights to all American citizens regardless of sex. For example, the ERA would eliminate laws like the Missouri Abortion Law, which would prohibit pregnant women from leaving the state to pursue an abortion. While it is very possible that this bill could be struck down under equal protection claims, the benefit of passing the ERA is that it would help fill the gaps and leave less room for judicial interpretation. This and other amendments would give the branch most representative of the people, Congress, more power to protect an evolving set of rights. In the words of Thomas Jefferson, the Bill of Rights is like all other human blessings, alloyed with some inconveniences, not accomplishing fully its object, but the good in this instance vastly outweighs the evil. While imperfect and perhaps incomplete, the Bill of Rights has provided a fundamental protection to Americans since the ratification of the Constitution. Thank you, and we stand ready for your questions. All right. You guys want to begin? Sure, I will. Uh, let's stick there in the uh, 1780s and 90s. Can you walk me through Madison here? I mean, he originally opposes amendments and then eventually leads the, uh, leads the charge for. Um, how, do you, how do you explain that? I think that when we're looking at Madison, we're looking at a founder who had a great deal of experience in he'd studied European history and the process of um, the rise and fall of the great republics, Rome and um, of antiquity. And I think what he saw and what he evolved in his thought process is although he was initially supportive of the constitution as a whole, I think he began to latch on to certain aspects of the constitution that could potentially be abused as in the necessary and proper clause and perhaps the commerce clause. And at the beginning of the ratification, or at the beginning of the Constitutional Convention, Madison actually didn't support a Bill of Rights. But by the end, or later during ratification, he came to support it after sending numerous letters to Thomas Jefferson, who argued for a Bill of Rights, basically saying that half a loaf of bread is better than no bread at all. Basically saying that if the Bill of Rights, even if it's not a whole protection against the government, it at least provides some sort of protection. Right, and this directly um, relates to why the amendment process and amendments are so important because this Bill of Rights was only an outline and um, Madison knew that we would need to build on this and um, add to it in the future. So talk to me a little bit about the vagueness of the executive power. You talked about the vagueness of the Supreme Court, um, but the, the executive power seems to be something uh, as big as the king's prerogative power, right? So how, how does a Bill of Rights help us confine uh, executive power under this constitution? Yeah, so in Federalist 70, Alexander Hamilton talked about um, that, that it, there needs to be energy in the executive, that essentially the president needs to be able to do things and because of the vague clause and the vague power given to him by um, Article 2, Section 1, that he, the executive power is vested in him, he needs some flexibility in doing what is necessary for stability and proper governance. Yeah, and I think that what's so interesting about that question is that we're getting to Jack's point about there being energy in the executive. I think one of the great things that the Bill of Rights provides, specifically through the Ninth Amendment, is a great, a great deal of energy in individual rights. Essentially that through the Ninth Amendment, we are able to have a living and truly evolving Bill of Rights through stuff like Gitlow v. Newark, securing the right to privacy, Bergefell v. Hodges, securing the right to um, marriage equality. Um, all these things allow for there to be energy and rights, which is really counteracts um, executive authority in some ways. Yeah, and we can look to Brutus one uh, when he stated that if the federal government is able to consolidate their powers, it would essentially make America a single nation government. So we need the Bill of Rights. Um, so the states and other clauses and forms of government have ways to enumerate their rights. Could you unpack a little bit for me uh, how you see the Ninth Amendment as informing uh, the expansion of rights? Because I, I don't see the Ninth Amendment in Gitlow, for example. Uh, yeah, sorry, I think I might have misspoke there. I meant Griswold v. Connecticut. My bad. Yeah, that's that. That was just a mistake oh, okay. on my behalf. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Does that uh, do you? Does the question still stand? Well, I, yeah, I mean, just just unpack for me. I mean, the Ninth Amendment is is I think for the Supreme Court mostly a truism, right? Something that they want to avoid interpreting if they possibly can. So, how, how do you how do you see that it's been an active uh, agent in all of this? 
I think that when we're looking at the Ninth Amendment and we're looking at the certain types of rights that it protects, we really have to consider there are kind of two general broad categories of rights that are in American jurisprudence. We have this idea of positive rights, which are claims that you can make upon the government to provide, say, a service or something like that. And then we also have this idea of negative rights, a zone of personal privilege that extends in areas which the government cannot interfere. And I think that what we found is that the Ninth Amendment has been great at protecting these types of negative rights, say privacy, um, uh, whether that be marriage privacy and all variety of that, but maybe not so good at protecting positive rights. Yeah, and part of the problem that comes with trying to find discover these positive rights to the Ninth Amendment is that it requires a large portion of the population to agree on these positive rights because we're making a claim upon the government. So, for example, a lot of people propose that we should add a, uh, an amendment um, declaring health care for all. But if healthcare is such a polarizing issue that if it can't even be agreed on for legislation, how can it be agreed on for something like an amendment? Yeah, and I think one of the major issues of the Ninth Amendment is that it leaves it up to the scope of the courts to determine what the court precedent will be. And we can see this issue in Roe v. Wade, where it made it made they made it illegal um, for the banning of abortions, but then now in 2020, we can see that that's been challenged in multiple states, for example, Oklahoma, Texas, and with the Missouri abortion law. So we've heard a number of teams suggest today that or maybe it was even yesterday when I was on another unit that healthcare should be considered a fundamental right. And, and you're talking about all the states opposing healthcare for all. And I certainly know what you're talking about because that's fighting words amongst certain political factions. Um, what is your position on whether or not that should be a fundamental right that, that should be maybe uh, put forth as an amendment. Yeah, so I think that we've had a bit of a long and storied history within jurisprudence of dealing with, we can obviously look back to uh, the Obamacare fights and the famous case NFIB v. Sebelius, um, which ultimately resulted in um, the individual mandate being passed. However, I think that the mechanism through which the individual mandate was passed might not be as legitimate as many would propose it to be because um, there is a great, uh, there's an argument to be made that Justice Roberts was legislating from the bench, bench when he made that um, certain changes to uh, the Affordable Care Act via NFIB. Um, and I mean, if we even go back to the founding era, a lot of um, people who are against this health care amendment say that the founders had no intention of this. And frankly, that's probably true, but that's not necessarily because they were against it. It's just because in the time of the founders, bloodletting was a common practice. Medicine wasn't at the point where it is now where it's considered such an important part of life that it is considered a right. Um, where does it matter where rights, where we get our rights? Where, where do rights come from? I think that it absolutely matters where we get our rights because there's certainly the stance that our rights are pre-exist government. Um, this would be the Lockean ideal of there, we are born with certain inalienable rights. Um, however, I think in the uh, when we're looking at it realistically, throughout the course of government, it's really been up to mostly the Supreme Court to decide rights. And I don't know if this is necessarily a good thing. I think that my colleagues would perhaps agree with me. Yeah, and a lot of the reason we've seen a reliance on the Supreme Court is because of this extreme political polarization that we've had in our country for decades. Um, and because of the standard in the vote, amount of votes that you need to pass an amendment, and enumerate something like these rights in the Constitution, um, relying on the Supreme Court has been a true pitfall in our system. But let me follow up with that. If, if you have concerns about the court finding our rights, discovering our rights, does that kind of make us British? I think that it potentially, this idea that our rights are originating from common law tradition would be a bit of a would be a bit of a British stance. However, I, I think I would flip. I think I would flip the uh, script a little bit on that. And I think that although the judicial branch is where we derive most of our rights from now, I don't think that that has to necessarily be the case. I think that if Congress was to step up and take a more active role in promoting amendments like the Equal Rights Amendment that we talk about in specifically enumerating these positive rights, specifically enumerating these claims that we make on the government, I think that we'd be a lot better off because amendments can stand the test of time better than uh, say a Supreme Court case. 
Yeah, and further to Kieran's point, I mean, a lot of our argument behind why we don't necessarily like the whole aspect of the Supreme Court being the most important in terms of protecting these rights is less about the court themselves and more the fact that these precedents can be so easily overturned. I mean, look at Miranda v. Arizona. It's considered one of the most um, important cases in due process right now, but it's being challenged in Tito v. Vega. And so if that gets overturned, um, it could fundamentally change how we deal with due process. Yeah, I would agree. I think when our rights as citizens aren't enumerated, it, it leaves a lot of room for um, them to be broken or um, not followed upon. And I think that we can see parallels with that in the British government, which is something that we definitely don't wanna see. Would you advocate changes in the electoral college, like abolishing it? Um, I certainly think there is an argument for it. Um, I mean, for states like Wyoming, um, they're wildly overrepresented. And the idea that possibly the election could be overturned from the will of the people, but because the electors feel that it isn't correct is a little bit, runs a little contrary to the idea that we live in a democratic republic. However, I would posit the idea that perhaps the electoral college gets kind of blamed for a lot of the issues that could be solved via things, say, multi-member districts. If we're dealing with this idea of multi-member districts established in the Reapportionment Act of 1929, which, in which basically the two parties essentially collaborated to block out third party participation, I think if we were to do something like, hey, maybe we should reevaluate the Reapportionment Act of 1929, we could perhaps avoid having to throw out an entire part of our um, governing history um, and still maintain voting rights. Okay, thanks. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. You always know we, it's a pretty high compliment that I had questions left and I bet Tim and Jack did too. Oh, yeah. You all, oh, yeah. You all yeah. covered so yeah. much ground. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm going to let them uh, give you their take on it, but I want you to know I was so, uh, so impressed. And every time I started to ask you another question about a case, you went on to something else and left me in the dust. So, uh, so I appreciate everything you had to say. I'm going to let these professors dissect it a little better than I have done. Thank you. Well, I like the fact that you started with ancient Persia. You've gone you've, it's about, it's about as far back as you can go. Uh, um, so, uh, We're going back past Britain, yeah. left yeah. Britain in the dust. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is great, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, and 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 it it makes it it very effectively makes the point that discussion of rights is not a new thing. That it's they have always been under discussion. Um, and that enumerating them has always been a possibility. So um, I think that was that was very effective in terms of introducing the the idea that the enumeration in the Constitution um, it wasn't a it wasn't a brand new thing, right? It wasn't it, and it wasn't our idea. It was uh, it, 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 it it was traditional. Um, and then just a couple of other things. Uh, you mentioned bloodletting. Uh, and, uh, you know, yeah, we've done away with bloodletting, except for the process of tenure. And that is, uh, <laughs> that is something that may be with us for a while. Uh, but I thought that was, that was nice and, uh, and, and effective. Uh, you talked about the electoral, uh, the, um, Congressional Count Act, whatever it was, 1924, right in multi-member districts um but there's there's an interesting example of something where um we have frozen things at a certain time and um you know maybe we don't need to but somehow we've done it and we're we're stuck with it so you know how do we get ourselves unstuck uh from from that kind of thing and and my electoral college question uh, was uh, was designed to 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 get there so um, I thought you guys had a whole lot of information, um, and I, but I really appreciated the, the framework that you created for us for uh, considering these questions. So uh, you've got a lot of information, you've got a framework, um, you now have responsibilities as citizens to make use of those things. 
um, in your conversations with your families and your friends and your um, uh, community. So um, go out and do that and uh, be a good citizen. So I'm sure you can be. So thank you very much for this conversation and I appreciate it. Yeah, I thought uh, as we went on, you guys got stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, I mean, by the time, you know, and you know, and you use framework to analysis for analysis. Uh, the question on the, the Ninth Amendment, um, Jack's question, does the Ninth Amendment really mattered much? And you, you created a framework. Well, let's talk about positive and negative liberty. Uh, and then you made some speculations based upon that framework. It's really, really, uh, it's really sophisticated. Uh, another thing you did is uh, on my, uh, you know, mommy, mommy, where do rights come from question. Um, you, you created a framework, um, you know, the, the, the Lockean tradition and, um, and more of a common law tradition, which led, you know, led to the, are we comfortable, are we, are we really more British than we uh, want to be? Uh, and our courts are a source of common law, not parliament. And, you know, so your framework, um, you use you use these frameworks very well. And as we went on, it got better and better. So I thought that was quite, um, quite pronounced. One little quibble I might have is I'd like to hear a little bit more history about Madison, um, you know, we his way through Congress and uh, trying to avoid us uh, because they are a faction of the anti-federalists. So, um, so this was good, but just a little more on the history, but it, it, this was really a strong presentation. I appreciated spending time with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. All right, one last round of applause for you and congratulate you on a job well done. Now the time that you can log off and celebrate, you're done. Thank you. <laughs> so have thank a good day and thank you for your hard work. Bye. 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 -bye.